Hello and welcome to Renewable Energy Integration Challenges, the first webinar of a series exploring the integration of renewable energy into power grids. I'm Adam Reed from the Renewable and Sustainable Energy Institute in Boulder, Colorado, USA. In this lecture and the rest within this series, we will explore the technical challenges involved in accommodating variable sources of renewable power, like wind, solar, wave, and tidal energy, into the electricity grid. For educational purposes, I've separated many of the technical issues from the market and regulatory issues. We will cover only the technical aspects of RE integration in this module and cover economics, regulation, markets, and development issues in other course modules. This division of content is valuable for grasping the many complexities of power grid operation, but it requires playing some make-believe. For the purpose of this module, we will pretend that the power grid is operated by a single, seamless entity that is only concerned with ensuring efficient and safe operation of the system, that is, delivery of energy to customers on demand with high reliability and at the lowest cost. This is, in many places, a simplification or outright fiction, as power grids often have a dizzying array of players that both compete and cooperate with each other in a nearly infinite spectrum of different market and regulatory structures around the world. But we're going to put all that aside for the sake of understanding the root operational challenges of RE integration. Don't worry, we'll return to the market topics in the next several modules, and they're lots of fun. But first, we have to understand the grid from a single operator's perspective. The integration of renewable energy into the power grid is becoming a popular topic in many parts of the world due to rising penetrations of renewable energy. Because of this flurry of activity, there is a good deal of confusion as to what the word integration actually means. In particular, it is easy to confuse renewable energy integration with renewable energy interconnection. Interconnection refers to the process of physically connecting a renewable energy source to the rest of the power grid, which occurs at what engineers call the bus bar, a strip of metal that conducts electricity between the generation system and the rest of the power system. Interconnection is a complex process dealt with by electrical engineers and involves numerous operational standards and grid codes that ensure compatibility in frequency and voltage between the energy produced by the generator and the energy on the rest of the grid. This is not our concern here as the topic is too technical for our treatment in this course. We are concerned instead with the actions of the system operator who must determine which power plants will provide energy in what amounts and at what times. This process is called generation dispatch. For purposes of this module, we will presume here that the system operator is also the transmission operator and must schedule power flows along the transmission system in accordance with dispatch. This is not always the case, though, and we'll discuss all of that in other modules dealing with markets and economics. None of these actions, at present, are new things to grid operators. Ordering generation dispatch and scheduling transmission according to uncertainty has been part of operating the power grid since its inception over a hundred years ago. This is due to a number of factors inherent in the power system. First, loads, the demand side of the power grid, are variable. We turn light switches, air conditioners, ovens, and televisions on and off according to our desires as consumers, with no regard for the impact of that action on the power system. Second, even conventional controllable generation is not 100% reliable. Plants may fail or go offline unexpectedly or need to be shut down for scheduled maintenance. Grid operators therefore have a pre-existing set of tools for both following changes in load throughout the day and ensuring that adequate reserves are standing by in case of an emergency. These go by many names and we'll talk about them in the abstract in this webinar. But in essence, they all involve modulating the output of controllable generation, like hydro, natural gas, oil, and diesel, in order to accommodate fluctuations on the system and keep the whole thing balanced. So the variability of RE is not a problem with which system operators are entirely unfamiliar. The problem is the increased amount of net variability on the system, or renewables plus load, and the higher quantities of balancing energy and other integration services that may be required with high penetrations of wind and solar. We will explore this problem here. The degree to which integration is a challenge depends heavily on the quantity of renewable energy that we need to integrate. So how much renewable energy are we talking about? The short and correct answer is that no one knows for sure. Our best guesses, however, suggest that we're looking at a lot of it. The International Energy Agency, or IEA, predicts massive growth in wind energy, for example, with China and the OECD Europe countries at annual wind generation figures of over 700 terawatt hours each by 2035. For purposes of comparison, the non-OECD countries collectively are expected to reach a bit over 20,000 terawatt hours of electricity production by the same year. So renewables won't necessarily be leading the charge by that year, but by a back-of-the-envelope calculation from the chart here, we can expect wind to provide around 12% of global electricity by 2035. Non-hydro renewables, especially wind, essentially wind and solar, currently provide about 3% of global generation. So that's a significant jump. 
And of course, all of this is highly uncertain because predicting energy trends in the future requires predicting politics and policies. This chart, for example, is based on data from IEA's new policies scenario, which presumes that world governments take some action toward addressing climate change, like putting some kind of global price on carbon. IEA also has a 450 parts per million scenario that presumes global action to keep CO2 concentrations below 450 parts per million. And that scenario predicts more rapid growth in renewables according to more aggressive policies. In any case, current penetrations of renewable energy in the U.S., Europe, and Asia are already causing power system operators to modify their strategies for integration. Let's talk about some of those strategies now. We have to start with the basics of the bulk power system. Imagine that you own and operate a self-contained electric power system in your neighborhood. It's not a huge system, but it will suffice here to simplify the system into an understandable abstraction. In order to keep the system from crashing, you have to ensure that generation matches load exactly at any given moment. If we end up with more generation than load on the system, we overload it and damage components. If we have too much load and not enough generation, parts of the system black out. We don't have any storage because storage is really expensive and we didn't want to pay for it. On your system, you have a couple of different generation assets. Let's say you've got a couple of different controllable generators, a natural gas turbine, a coal or nuclear plant, and a diesel generator. You've also got a wind plant. Now, how do you integrate the wind plant? First, we need to look at the system without thinking about the wind plant. The purple line in the chart describes load, that's energy demand, over a three-week period. You can figure this out without even looking at the numbers on the x-axis. Why? Because demand fluctuates regularly for five days, then drops over two days. That's your work week and weekend, respectively. At the end of each day, load drops as we turn off our lights, the temperature cools off and we don't need air conditioning, and sleep. In the morning, load shoots up as we all get to work, AC cranks up, computer and lighting activity increase, etc. The weekend has a smaller ramp because our office buildings aren't occupied. Now, without thinking of the wind plant, how do you go about meeting this demand pattern? The answer that most system operators have come to is to optimize operations for least cost without affecting reliability. The decision of when and in what amounts to call on generators to supply power is known as dispatch. Our cheapest generators are usually the coal or nuclear plant. So we turn those on, and they run essentially 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, under constant dispatch. We call those baseload generators. The downside to coal and nuclear is that you can't ramp them. Turning them up or down in output is hard on the plants, wastes fuel, and shortens the lifespan of the equipment. So we need another class of generators to follow the ramp up of load in the morning and the ramp down of load in the evening. That's when we dispatch our natural gas generators. They have fast ramp rates and are more adept at moving their output level up or down according to instructions. They also cost more to run because of the cost of their fuel. But we only want to install enough natural gas to meet the average load peak. On especially hot summer days, power demand may exceed this average. For this, we have peaking generators, which are the most expensive assets we have on a kilowatt hour basis, and may only run a couple of hours every year. Their advantage is that they have extremely fast ramping capabilities. Peaking generators may also run on natural gas, but use a different technology called the simple combustion turbine. They might also run on diesel. So we're using our cheapest generation, coal or nuclear, first, then turning on successively more expensive generators as needed to meet demand. This is called least cost system operation. So far, so good. Now, let's add in our wind plant, the blue line on the bottom. Notice that immediately our whole paradigm shifts. We can't turn wind on or off. It's available when it's available. But it's got no fuel and is thus our lowest cost resource. Even if it costs more on a levelized cost of energy basis, we've already paid the capital costs and we want to use it whenever it's available. How do we do that and keep our least cost controllable dispatch model? The answer is that we subtract wind generation, shown on this chart in green, from load, shown here in yellow, and get a new load profile that includes our wind energy in blue. We call that the load net of wind. We then use our conventional assets to meet this new load curve. Now compare the blue line to the yellow one. Note that the blue line is less regular, less predictable than the yellow. The diurnal pattern of daytime and nighttime energy use now has a new component from the wind power. It varies over the course of several days as weather systems move through the area. Notice also, in this case at least, that we have lower peaks, so we aren't using our diesel generator as much over this time period. So our flexible natural gas generators follow the new load net of wind curve, but we have to keep a closer eye on the whole system because it isn't as predictable as before. But overall, it looks like a pretty good deal. We've got free wind displacing our natural gas and we've lowered our hourly system generation costs. But it doesn't always work out so well. Here we have another depiction of bulk power system operation, this time with a depiction of cumulative dispatch from a simulation effort in the western United States. 
Notice on the left that we have a system with no renewables except hydro, which is, together with natural gas, dispatched by the system operator to meet daily demand. This is because both of these sources have very fast ramp rates as compared to the basically flat operation of the coal and nuclear units. But on the right, things get wacky. This is a worst case scenario. When we add in massive amounts of wind that have big variations both throughout the day and from day to day, the system gets into trouble. The wind takes up the space that was previously occupied by natural gas combined cycle plants, which are now sitting idle. Why? Because the wind is zero cost, so we use it whenever it's available. Meanwhile, we don't have to start ramping our base load coal we have to start ramping our base load coal plant down because there's so much wind available and we don't want to waste it, a process called curtailment, where wind plants are disconnected from the grid. But then the wind starts to die down, and we have to start ramping our coal plant back up to follow it, along with peaking gas turbines. Remember, we can't use our combined cycle plants because they're sitting idle and can't get up and running as fast as the combustion turbines. But the coal plant is moving too slowly to its new output set point, and we don't have enough combustion turbines to keep up. Notice that by the end of the week, we're well below demand. That means parts of the grid are blacked out. Of course, this probably isn't what would actually happen on the grid if we got a lot of wind. It's just an illustration of what a hyper-rigid least-cost dispatch algorithm would do. In reality, we would curtail the wind to avoid ramping the coal plant because the cost of having the system black out and paying penalties to regulators is far higher than the money we lose by not using all the available wind. Thus, our least cost behavior is constrained by an overriding priority for reliability of service. But it does provide a good illustration of how lots of renewable power without sufficient, sufficient system flexibility can be too much of a good thing. There's another part of our job as the unified system operator, and that's ensuring that we can physically move the power generated from our plants to where the power is needed. To, to do that, we need transmission over high voltage lands for long distances and step down low voltage lines for local distribution. We can't control where energy goes once we put it into the transmission system. It will take the path of least resistance, ultimately heading towards ground. By predicting what that path is, our operator must match up the dispatch order that she uses to meet load with the available transmission path, a process called scheduling. Transmission capacity is limited, and if a line hits capacity, energy will get pushed onto other lines, just like water in a series of pipes. If there's no other line for the energy to go to, equipment connected to the transmission system, including transmission infrastructure itself, can become damaged. We can think of transmission capacity as falling into two categories. Network transmission covers transmission to move electricity from a generator to a load within a single control area of the grid, and is local. Point-to-point -point involves the use of transmission lines to move electricity from one control area to another. Network flows have priority in most transmission systems, and the ability to use transmission lines to pass through electricity from one place to another is limited by the extent to which network flows are already using transmission lines. Because an energy system has many generators, many miles of transmission, and variable loads, energy sometimes flows down lines without explicit planning. These are referred to as unscheduled flows. As you might imagine, having variable renewable energy plants on your system results in more unscheduled flows, and so scheduling of transmission for controllable power plants must take into consideration the possibility that the line might get filled up if a wind plant is at high output unexpectedly. Different transmission operators deal with this in different ways. For example, in a grid with multiple transmission owners, those owners require compensation for unscheduled flows that may interfere with already scheduled transmission. In a grid with a single transmission owner, by contrast, these costs are internalized. We can generalize here to say that variable renewable energy creates a need for closer monitoring of the transmission system to ensure that the system does not become overloaded. Moreover, transmission constraints may in turn affect the feasibility of other dispatch operations for conventional generators, and so a generator that appears ideal for dispatch on a generation cost basis may not have access to available transmission capacity and so cannot dispatch. It's helpful to think of dispatch and scheduling like an online auction where you want to buy something and then have it shipped. Dispatch is like the bidding process on an auction website for the item itself. But even when you've won and bought the item, you still need to arrange shipping for it. That's transmission scheduling. While the two are completely separate operations, they can still affect each other in an economic sense. I might find my item for a really good price, but if it costs too much to ship it, I may not buy it after all. Thank you for your attention.